Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. In fact, um, the big data and just technology-driven way of running societies has been has failed partly because we're putting all certain data together that should be separate. And uh, for example, when it comes to your life, you play different kinds of roles, right? As a professor, for example, or researcher, as a father or mother, as somebody who has friends and gives parties, somebody who is in a sports club and so on. And in all those different situations, we behave in different ways, you know. So we have sophisticated lives. And that's why we need to separate the data, describing these different roles, those several, uh, se separate personas in a sense. And that's why we need to have context-aware data. This is where the, even the things will come in, but we shouldn't forget about people, right? So smarter societies are a combination of people with technology. But let's go through the development of those technologies. So we're living, without any doubt, in a time of big data. Within just a minute, you're producing 700,000 Google queries, 500,000 Facebook posts. We are moving, we are shopping, all of that creates data, and that data allows us to see all sorts of things, what is wrong, uh, where the system is broken, and hopefully how to fix it. At least that's the dream. And Chris Anderson basically assumed that if you just ha had enough data, then we wouldn't need Siri any longer. The truth would come out by itself, and the data would tell us what to do. And so people started to ask, can we know everything? Can we actually build a crystal ball that allows us to see what's going on in the, in the world in any place in real time or even predict the future and in fact there are people and institutions that are working on such kind of prediction machines now the question is would it do the job and the answer is unfortunately not because there are a lot of spurious correlations in those data for example, this one, number of serial killers is a function of chocolate consumption. <laughs> if that was true, I wouldn't live in Switzerland. It would be just too dangerous, right? And we would have to lock away all those people who love chocolate. Well, in fact, it turns out that a lot of scientific findings are false. And that has to do with the difficulties of statistics. Now, if you think that was a problem of having small data, that I mean not enough data, then unfortunately you're wrong because the bigger your data set, the more patterns are in that data set. So if you look up into the sky, <clears throat> there are all sorts of patterns that you see, but do they have a meaning? So finding a meaningful causal relationship is still almost a lucky thing, you know, like as difficult as finding a grain of gold. And even if you have a strong correlation like this one, number of forest fires as a function of children who eat ice cream, you know, <laughs> we'll find a really strong correlation, but this is both caused by a third factor, heat. And so if you if would now put children to prison, obviously you know, forest fires wouldn't go away. But some of predictive policing, unfortunately, is based on a similar way of arguing. And we need to be very careful about these approaches. So if big data doesn't do the job, would artificial intelligence fix the world? And in fact, there is an intelligence explosion now in that area. Within a couple of years, we expect to have machines that surpass the intelligence of people. and so. The question is, would AI enable a benevolent dictator that would find out what needs to be done in this world and tell us or just do it for us? Or would AI be something like a digital god? 
Well, for some years already, computers are better chess players. Robots are better workers in many places. Um, they might be better drivers, maybe better doctors even, better in answering questions, at least those that have an answer already. Better scientists. Well, at least robots become more and more capable and sophisticated. They can learn, they can build other robots, they might be able to build smarter robots that means in a sense multiply and evolve, right? There's a new species, in fact many new species will have thousands of new AI species. Intelligent machines will be our tools in the beginning and then teammates and then coaches and then our bosses. Is this what we want? In fact, there's already research on this. Some people think you know, we would accept instructions from a robot more likely than instructions by another person. So we get into another kind of ethical trouble, you know, because we may need to upgrade ourselves to be competitive. So we'll have brain implants question is who would go for an upgrade? Raise your hands, come on. Just two, three, four, five, okay, uh, we're getting there, so there's a new market, huh? So um, it's being tested already. There are already cyborgs around us, and you know, is, is this the future? Will we have to genetically engineer humans with CRISPR-Cas9 and other methods. Uh, and this kind of thinking and research is actually going on. And these are not the only problems that we are facing right now. Because with all that artificial intelligence, a lot of the work that humans are now doing, in particular routine work, will be done by algorithms and robots. 50% people say. So we'll see what some people have phrased as end of work. 50% of jobs will be gone in a couple of years. And uh, IT companies think the problem will not be seen only in 15 years from now, but in two to four years from now. So it's just in front of the door, basically. You know, We're in trouble. Already a lot of young Europeans don't have a job that's undermining social peace. In fact, there's just a few companies where young people can still find jobs with a reasonable effort. And it's not just challenging actually for employees, it's also challenging for companies because 40% of today's top 500 companies will be gone in 10 years. So we're seeing the next industrial revolution and our society is transforming, and we'll come back to this later on. And there are even bigger problems. <coughs> because artificial intelligence might be dangerous. And there has been an open letter on weaponized AI asking to ban it and it's been signed actually by tens of thousands of people. And nothing happened so far. So that's why Elon Musk said, you know, worth reading super intelligence by Buster. We need to be super careful with AI, potentially more dangerous than nukes. In fact, I believe he's he's right because a nuclear bomb would destroy a certain area. AI could just turn off the internet. And that would be a global problem. So this is the book he was talking about. And it's about artificial intelligence escaping the lab. And then people have always said, no, don't worry, we can always pull the plug if it doesn't behave well. 
And actually what this movie describes has in a sense already happened because AI is free. You know, it's open source. Everyone can use it. Even a terrorist is there. <clears throat> and it's not still not the worst case, I believe. My claim is that after the automation of production and driving, the automation of society is next. And I believe that this is the reason why Elon Musk and others have been so alerted about AI. Elon Musk said, I think we should be super careful about artificial intelligence. If I had to guess what is our biggest existential threat, it's probably that. And he's not the only one. Stephen Hawking is worried. He said humans were limited by a slow biological evolution, couldn't compete and would be superseded. Bill Gates, I'm in the camp that is concerned about super intelligence. And Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, said computers are going to take over from humans. No question. Will we be the gods? Will we be the family pets or will it be ants that get stepped on? I don't know. Humans built it. No. Don't blame anyone else. So, we always thought artificial intelligence would solve our problems, you know. In about 20 years, once we have this super intelligent machine, we would be so smart within a very short time that we would understand all our problems and solve all our problems, you know, so people have been waiting for this, you know, praying for that moment in a sense. And we thought it's objective, it's neutral and unbiased, it it's, uh, doesn't make mistakes and all these kind of things. And then it turns out, well, in, in fact, <laughs> it's easy to manipulate as a human. So the Thai chatbot was turned into a Nazi within a short time. And I forgot to put one slide in here. It also turns out that AI is di discriminating people. People of color, women, and they, AI hasn't been programmed to do that, but it turns out it does it. We haven't seen that before. So. It's not objective, it's not neutral. We don't even know what it's doing, it's a black box. And if we think AI would optimize the world, what would it optimize? What's the goal function? We don't know. And we don't know what should be the goal function. Should it be GDP per capita? Should it be sustainability, power, peace, uh, happiness, life expectancy, whatever. So the problem is not solved by far and will not be solved in 30 years by itself. Now there are <laughs> the crime stories on TV recently, just a few days ago, where they think about which AI kill people or be able to kill people? That's a question that also Stephen Hawkins has asked. And in fact, um, AI will kill people. Uh, it has already killed people. I mean, humans happen to be an accident too. It turns out that though that some of those accidents wouldn't have been done by people, right? So here's the issue. Okay, so if you want to have a little bit more discussion about all these things, there's this book that I've written, the Automation of Society is Next, and describes two paradigms of automation, top-down and bottom-up. Uh, you can already feel that I'm not so much for the top-down approach, but think the bottom-up would do it. And that's how we should use the Internet of Things, to enable bottom-up self-organization. But before we get into this, you know, could society be run like a giant machine? That has been an idea that was around for some time. It's behind the smart cities and smart nations concepts and smart world, you know, brave new world in a sense. <laughs> what do you have to do? You need to know all those parts, what they're doing and how they can be manipulated. And in fact, IT companies are working on 
an operating system for the world, not just for computers and smartphones, for the world. And there was this campaign, IBM Watson for President, for example, and Google wants to reprogram the state, and Facebook has imperial ambitions. They all want to rule the world, you know, that's you, you know. And the question is, who of you wants this to happen? Nobody? So, brain upgrades, but no AI ruling the world? That's interesting. Okay, and there are also scientific institutions that are bidding in this competition. And the interesting thing about CERN is it's on extraterritorial area, so that means no national or international law applies. So they could do all sorts of things. Well, all of that started actually in Chile, where a cybernetic society was built. At that time, it was about improving production, but they couldn't handle people. People were unpredictable, right? And that's eventually changing. Singapore is one of the nations that has made most progress in this area. And so what's being done is machine learning, in particular deep learning, is being used to learn what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we can be manipulated, you know, with all the data that has been collected about you secretly, without your knowledge most of the time. You now that data is still there. It feeds those AI algorithms. And what are they doing with it? Well, they're trying to make you do certain kind of things. Personalized information steers your attention, your opinions, your decision making, your behavior. It tries to do that. It tries you to make you click certain links. It tries to make you book certain hotels and flights and meet certain partners and all these kind of things. And of course, spend money. But the question is, now, is that just a hypothetical possibility or is this happening already? And if you look at pictures like these, now it you could get the impression, well, there is already some degree of remote control of people, potentially at least, right? And so that's obviously not just interesting for companies that want to sell products, but also for politics. And there it's called nudging. And if it's combined with big data of all your behaviors, then we call it big nudging. And the idea behind that is behaviorism as it has been formulated by Skinner. So the idea was that we also just machines that can be programmed. And that's called conditioning. And that conditioning is done with rewards and punishment. Food and electrical charges, pain, pain and pleasure basically, you know. And we are also kept in cages. These cages are filter bubbles. And these are made up of personalized information built around us to steer our attention, opinions, behavior, and so on. You know. So what you see on your computer is not the same thing as what your neighbor would see if you search for a certain thing at Google or even if you read the news, you know, the titles might be different, the pictures might be different. In the future, the text will be customized to you. If you and your neighbor read this, the same news, it's not the same news, in fact. You know. That's, that is wh where we are heading. Now, why I get excited about it doesn't hurt. You know. It's a brave new world, you know, comfortable. But the issue is that it becomes difficult to think out of the box. 
And that's what we need to do to come up with innovations to solve the problems that humanity is confronted with. Anyway, the, if you think I'm the only one <laughs> who makes such claims and things this way, not at all. So I recommend you to read you books like this, The Program Human, The Herrschafts Formal, The Smart Dictatorship, and so on. And even people like Tim Cook actually criticize this approach heavily. You know. So the question is, has the internet turned into a trap? And how to free ourselves. And that's why I believe Elon Musk came up with OpenAI to democratize AI. So, well, wouldn't big nudging be a good idea? That's the question. You know, it sounds plausible if you're confronted with an apple and the muffin, you should eat the apple, it's more healthy, right? So why not tempt you to do that? You know, just nudge you, you know, right? Well, the issue is that I almost died of an apple, you know, allergic reaction. It's, um, in fact, there's nothing that's good for everyone. If you go to the doctor, the doctor would say, you know, eat nuts, it's healthy. But there are people who would die of eating nuts. You know? And in fact, over the years, there has been a lot of evidence-based literature about healthy diets. But every few years, what they recommend has changed. So <laughs> there's a problem. And besides that, we're all different. You know? That's why we need, for example, personalized medicine. You know? And that, that is where the Internet of Things can help. Again, you know, t context dependence, right? <coughs> but we have to be aware that classification errors will happen. You know? We want to distinguish good and bad risks. We want to distinguish what's good for you and what's bad for you. But you know, points are often overlapping. And so there will be errors of first kind, of, of second kind, false alarms, alarms that don't go off. And you may remember this product where you could have a genetic test for a cheap price and would tell you what are the likely diseases you would get and what <laughs> is the likely source of deaths. You know? And that product was taken off the market for some time, because actually it turns out if you send a genetic probe to another company, you know, it would also come up with a prediction, but it might look quite different. Because even big data analytics can be quite sensitive to single data points. And different companies would have different data sets, right? In fact, there are some people who should be terribly ill according to the genetic defects that they have, but some of them are absolutely healthy, you know. So what's going on here? So we see we have by far not understood well enough how to make use of data. Again, Internet of Things might deliver higher quality data, but still, then it has always been claimed, OK, we'll use big nudging to the better of society, right? We'll make you live more healthy, more environmental friendly, love other people, you know, so peaceful world and so on. But what happens instead is you know, companies are trying to make you drink these sugar lemonades, and then your health insurance comes has a very different interest, right? And comes up with a citizen score that punishes you for this, you know. So basically it's like one entity tries to steer you doing this thing and the other one doing that thing. It's like a family sitting in front of a TV and everyone having a remote control, you know. You can imagine how it ends. It's this, you know, a big battle. 
And this is happening, you know. We see that our society is in a process of polarization and it's about to break apart into pieces, in a sense, into these filter bubble communities, you know, because we don't understand each other anymore. We don't see that there are other positions, other ways of thinking, other realities, because they're closed into, locked into other filter bubbles. So, it doesn't work well. Big nudging doesn't help us with all those things that are related to interactions, family, friends, solidarity, social capital, culture, and so on. And now, eventually, we have this discussion about manipulation of our thinking by Facebook, and that um, actually social media are causing extremism, radicalism, and we have entered, some people say, a fact-free world, where it becomes more and more difficult actually to distinguish what, what is true and what is not true. Obama himself is warmed of this. He said, you know, this is also a time around the world when some of the fundamental ideals of liberal democracies are under attack and when notions of objectivity and of a free press and of facts and of evidence are trying to be undermined or in some cases ignored entirely. Uh, and how is this done? Well, for example, social bots are uh, amplifying tweets, uh, producing own tweets and you know, Facebook posts and all this and this has been used also for the Brexit propaganda. And so no surprise that people regret it afterwards what was going on. And it was actually quite costly for our economy. Three trillions were gone. You know. It's not a funny game anymore. You know. This has become a reality, a dangerous reality. And so even people like Cass Sunstein, who were supporting this idea of nudging initially, you know, has become much more concerned about it. And says, you know, there are a lot of misuses of that technology that we should stay away from. Then I told you, you know, reward and punishment is the principle, right? So would we be punished? And the answer is yes. And particularly because um, the nudging approach is not as effective as those people would like it to be. And there are other feedback mechanisms that are maybe more effective, like personalized pricing. So immediate reward or punishment. You know? Depending on what you did before, you would have to pay more or get a, a discount. You know? And there's this citizen score that's being tested where citizens would get points for everything they do or don't do. For everything that you click on the internet even. Whether well, that's consistent with what the government loves or not. Uh, there's a similar program in UK, it's called Karma Police. You know, it, it looks what radio m music you're listening to, it's interested in what porn you're watching, and all sorts of things, you know, that gives you plus and more, minus points. So there is a citizen score, and that determines, uh, would determine in China what kind of jobs you can get, <coughs> how much would they have to pay for a loan, what are the countries that you can visit. So that's a pretty totalitarian approach, right? And then there would be predictive policing, who would make trouble would be taken out of society before that happens. And all of that's based not only on what you're doing, also what your friends are doing, your neighbors are doing, your colleagues are doing because that would potentially influence your behavior. So if you meet somebody with a low score, that would reduce your score and all this, you know. So is that the society that we'd like to live in? 
so who thinks that would be a fantastic society? Uh, nobody. <laughs> Come on! I mean, you spend billions on that kind of technology. Now we have to love it, right? So our society is at a crossroads. Now, the bad and the good news is that there are many ways of designing a digital society. We could build fascism 2.0, a big brother society or a the world society we could build communism 2.0, a uh, benevolent dictatorship, uh, feudalism 2.0, surveillance capitalism. All of that doesn't sound very democratic, unfortunately. In fact, there are people who say uh, democracy is an uh, outdated technology. It produced wealth, health, and happiness for billions of people on the entire globe, but now we want to do something else. Period. And people are asking, is democracy dead? And in fact, you know, it just took a few years and it's more or less dead in Turkey, in Poland, in Hungary, in France. So uh, we might lose everything we built over hundreds of years, namely self-determination and freedom human dignity, assumed innocence, fairness, justice, pluralism, democracy, participation, all this, you know. And besides that, such a powerful system that we could build, you know, just extrapolate what has been disclosed, disclosed by Snowden, extrapolate that from 2008 to 2016, considering the technology we have today, and assume we would put a hundred billion into this, you know, what could we build? That would be a very powerful machine, no question. But it could be hacked. In fact, <laughs> not only uh, the military has been hacked, the White House has been hacked, uh, the Pentagon has been hacked, uh, <laughs> NSA has been hacked too. So, sooner or later, that technology would be misused, you know. Everything that can happen will happen. You know, that's Murphy's Law, we, we know that. So we need to be concerned about it. Um, cars have been hacked, planes have been hacked, you know. So I think it's about time to say, stop, maybe we're taking the wrong path. This idea that there would be a benevolent dictator, potentially, is flawed. Not only that there's counter evidence that against the possibility to optimize the world. You know, we, we don't have enough computer power for this. We don't have enough data. But even if we could, what goal function should we choose? There's no science telling you this, you know. So for the last 150 years or so, we have chosen GDP per capita. You know, we have created this carbon-based economy, and now we say, oh my god, we shouldn't have done it. It's an existential threat, not only for humanity, but for the entire planet. You know. So. We, we're not good at this, uh, at deciding what would be the right plan, uh, goal function for the planet. The solution, in fact, is pluralism. And say everyone needs to find out himself or herself what's good for him or her. And companies, too. That's why we have pluralism. But that means not one goal function. And nobody, no government and no super intelligent computer could decide what's the right goal function for us. Sorry, not possible. And besides, you know, whenever there is a big power differential, things go wrong, as we've seen in the Stanford prison experiment. And besides, actually, there is no empirical evidence that a benevolent dictator approach would perform better. On the contrary, <coughs> and in fact, the entire world economy has come to a halt. And that actually fits this idea that we're trying to optimize the world, 
but you know, as you try to optimize, you get closer and closer to the optimal solution, and then that's it. You know, you can't get beyond that optimal solution. But we want to have this curve, right? Gross. So, how does that come about? Not by optimization, but by evolution. Trying out new things, challenging old solutions. Even questioning goal functions, you know, all this. And in fact, the economy in the US uh, hasn't benefited to, to the extent that it was expected, and therefore this open letter, and uh, recently this technology-driven approach has been qu questioned too, the old smart cities approach. And the idea now is that we need to open up systems and have participatory information <laughs> innovation systems, ecosystems where everyone can contribute and benefit. You know? And suddenly we have this discussion about ethical IT innovation. And we know it's, it's necessary because, for example, if trust gets lost, that's extremely costly. You know? Financial crisis cost us 14,000 trillions. The, scandal around uh, manipulation of emission cost uh, Volkswagen at least 10 billions. Not, that's not the end, no. So ethics is there basically to ensure a sustainable solution, a sustainable world, right? It's not something for sissy boys, it's wisdom. And so what should we do now? Well, we need to ensure democratic control, scientific use, ethical use, transparency, um, prevent misuse, and ensure informational self-determination. So now suddenly, fortunately, we have this discussion, can AI be ethical? And we should make algorithms accountable for what they're doing, right? All a very important discussion. Now, the main argument, though, is that despite big data and powerful technology, our existential problems have not been solved. Like climate change, financial, economic, and spending crisis, conflict, war, migration, terrorism, And in fact, they're all the result of one root cause, which is the lack of sustainability. Now, we're overusing resources, those resources are lacking elsewhere. That's what produces war and mass migration and terrorism and all this, you know. We need to face it. And we know it in principle since about 50 years, 40, 50 years at least. Limit to growth, global 2000. Uh, two studies that uh, have looked into this and have found that, that we would have an economic and population collapse. That's now coming up pretty soon, according to predictions. This is our problem. That's what we should have focused on, you know. And if we can't change that scenario, and for this, we need to change the equations behind those scenarios, which means to change the socioeconomic organization of our economy and society. If we don't manage to do this, then we need to learn to die in the atrophy, you know. And, and that is what is really behind that discussion about ethical dilemmas. It's not about, you know, if Tesla can't break early enough and you know somebody has to die, you now the driver or some other person, you know, who would have to die? You know, and sh should it be the cat or the driver, should it be uh, the the grandma or the kid, should it be the the student or the politician or the manager, you know? It's not about cars this discussion. This discussion is about if our planet cannot sustain the seven or maybe project 11 billion people on that planet, who would have to die and who would decide it? Who would decide who would get food, 
immunization shots, medicine, all these kind of things. So now, would it be a super intelligent system to decide this based on all the data collected about us, based on citizen scores? No, well, now that's the question. And what, what are the options that we have? You know, reduce population, you know, war pandemics, euthanasia, all sorts of things, or reorganize our society, change the framework, change the equations behind those scenarios. And I think there are actually new approaches. And you know, current law says that to save five people, we're not allowed to kill one person. But it's our obligation to reduce the probability that people would die. So that means our obligation is to change the system if that can increase the number of people that our planet can feed. And that requires a completely different approach, you know, a new kind of thinking. And that kind of thinking really needs to take into account that the world is a complex system. And even though processing power is exploding, data volume is exploding even more, so that data volume cannot be processed anymore. It's less and less percentage of the data that we can process. And even that data is not enough to describe the complexity of the world because as we connect things with each other, actually, that creates combinatorial complexity and that implies a loss of top-down control. Now the question how to deal with that complexity, you know, should we cut it away and simplify the world? The answer is no, because complexity is growing naturally with time due to differentiation, sharing labor, a division of labor, and all these kind of things. So that's a natural thing. We need to learn how to turn that complexity and diversity into a benefit. And that requires AI systems, you know. That requires AI systems. So we need to learn to cut the Gordian knot. We need to basically design systems in a way that are made for complex systems. And that requires mortal law design, subsidiarity, diversity. And we need to understand that society cannot be steered like a car because interactions produce unexpected things, such as these phantom traffic jams. You know, even if we could read the minds of all people, you know, we could see the traffic jam happen, but we couldn't prevent it because the mechanism behind traffic jam formation doesn't depend on decisions of people. It's based on an amplification effect of small variations. So, in fact, in a complex system, a minimally invasive approach is advised. And we basically know this, our body is also a complex system, you know, if you, take medicine, we need to know what kind of medicine, how much of it, at what time. Too much, you know, more is not better. It would poison our body. There could be interaction effects between different medicines. If we do this, you know, is the best way to poison our body and, you know, create chaos, right? So, minimal interference, and that requires wisdom, knowing how to do it. You know, it. Again, Internet of Things might be a solution here if we use it the right way. And in fact, you know, there is a way of overcoming those traffic jams that I'm now simulating here to show you that we understand the process, that we have equations describing it, and we'll soon see what is actually the reason for the traffic jam or we'll turn that car into a flying object and we'll see that uh, 
their car is trying to get on the freeway and that produces small disruptions and those are amplified and that's what causes a stop and go traffic now assume we equip those cars with radar sensors that measure distances and relative velocities locally and we would uh, let cars drive in an autonomous way using that information according to a formula that have we, uh, we have invented that would produce a favorable collective behavior based on local interactions no centralized control here we call that mechanism design mechanism design here is actually improving the stability of the flow and the capacity and in fact it's based on feedback loops that change those interactions between the cars in a favorable way and that can be done actually in society on multiple levels you know rather than really deciding from the top what everyone would have to do that would be the right approach. Have an incentive system on multiple levels, you know, and then give degrees of freedom to m basically reach those goals. <clears throat> and we've applied the similar thing to cities. So rather than using a traffic control center, we let traffic flows control the traffic lights in a flexible way and improves actually the performance dramatically. It's also good for the environment and such decentralized approaches actually are also becoming more important in smart grids in industry 4.0 and that could also be the basis of a better organization of our society so the approach would be to create digital assistance to support decisions now but this time in contrast to the big notching approach by that super intelligent centralized machine you know we would decide to turn it on or off we should would, we would choose the goals and then we would get several options and we choose and the digital assistant helps us to reach our goals in an optimal way right that's how it would work and that could be developed towards creating guides that would help us to overcome cultural barriers, understand other languages, understand other cultures, understand uh, how systems work, how we can be beneficially interact, how to organize new systems, how to combine success principles of different cultures in a beneficial way to understand how to interact with new AI systems and all these kind of things, right? This would be the approach. Decentralized AI, building collective intelligence. We'll come back to that. So, no question, our society is undergoing a transformation, a fundamental transformation, maybe the biggest one this planet has seen in the history of humankind. And it's a triple transformation. Uh, it's an, um, that transformation is needed in order to uh, get to a new economic and societal level, right? You've seen such transformations in the past, not just in that magnitude. And there's three transformations. Uh, one is driven basically by automation, loss of jobs and all this. It's a digital transformation. The second one is uh, ecological transformation towards sustainable, low carbon economies. And the third one is transformation of our financial system all of that needs to happen in just a few years you know this is now our job so yes with the internet of things combined with blockchain technology and complexity science we can now build an efficient liberal participatory social and ecological economy before you know these different attributes didn't go together they were fighting against each other now we can build a system that has it all we need to build this post-carbon economy no question and the only way to sustain 7 or 11 billion people on that planet is to reuse those limited resources that we have and that means build a circular economy and a sharing economy now, that's our survival strategy now this is our obligation 
And how to do that? Well, use the Internet of Things. And we are building a particular platform called NeurusNet. Use that Internet of Things to measure externalities. So how can we do it? In every smartphone, there are a lot of sensors. And of course, we can buy additional sensors to put in this room and environment, public space, whatever. Con connected together, build a global measurement system. But uh, we recommend to run it in a decentralized way. That's what we're doing. And uh, we can use it to measure noise, emissions, poisons, uh, waste, unemployment, all these kind of things. Give it a, a price. We can measure positive things like, you know, happiness, reuse of resources, cooperation, new jobs, you know, give it a value and create a multidimensional differentiated financial market or call it an incentive system, you know, a pluralistic incentive system that allows you to create all those micro feedbacks that would incentivize re the reuse of resources, the reuse of waste and all these kind of things. And it's now possible to create this as Bitcoin has shown. You know, we can now run a financial system in a bottom-up way and it's time to, to do that. Then also, the world is too complex to be understood by a single person or even a supercomputer or an AI system. And that's why we need to enable collective intelligence. So we need to have platforms that allow to bring the knowledge and ideas of many people together online deliberation platforms that allow us to put all the arguments on the table, organize them, work out the different perspectives on a complex problem, integrate those different perspectives, come up with innovative solutions. You know? So the interesting thing about collective intelligence is there's no single best individual solution combine some of those solutions that people come up with will produce a better solution in many cases. So diversity wins, not the best. Different perspectives are essential to come up with good solutions, you know, and this is actually what, what bees are doing, is sending out those worker bees into all sorts of directions and come back and say, you know, I, I found some honey but not so much. And another says, so oh, that direction was actually quite um, productive and uh, promising. So there would be an integration process and it would, it would be decided what to do. And uh, I, th I think in many cases, our chancellor is, is trying to do such a thing. And in the cases where she doesn't listen first and integrate all those different perspectives, then it goes wrong. You know, it's, um, so the solution for the future is not telling everyone you know, what exactly to do, but to create new opportunities for everyone, empower people to come up with better decisions, better solutions, and combinatorial innovation is the right approach. And it requires value pluralism, not just economic efficiency, but there were many other things that mattered to really empower good solutions, solutions that work for many people, you know. And in fact, we know that freedom promotes creativity and innovation, so not telling people what to do and the most diverse economies are the most successful. So the right approach is to build an ecosystem based on interoperability, based on participatory opportunities, and that can uh, enable combinatorial innovation. In fact, the nice thing about the digital economy is it's, it's unlimited. It's not material. You know, we could all be doing well. We could all be rich in different dimensions. But we don't organize the digital economy like a material economy. What some companies are trying to do, you know, it's a matter of the intellectual property right that we are now implementing.
We shouldn't make mistakes here because there is unlimited potential. There could be new opportunities for all. We can all produce data and the ServiceNet system would allow us to do that. Um, also provide data for everyone to do data analytics and everyone could come up with applications and services. Just we want to have a system that we can trust and that's why it needs to be an information system controlled by the people, a citizen web. And this is what we could do with ServiceNet. You know, Real-time measurement, greater awareness, remote science, self-organizing system, collective intelligence, and so on. I need to come to an end, right? So I'll um, skip a few slides. I think you have understood the point. And so I'm coming to my end by saying, well, I don't think that super intelligence will solve all our problems. You know, I'm fine with AI, but uh, I think uh, we should aim at collective intelligence, at uh, human computer <coughs> symbiosis. You know, that's the paradigm, partnerships working together. And so the future that we should be aiming is a, is a network, well-coordinated, distributed system of largely autonomous system rather than one system that controls us all like a monstrous machine. So. I think it's smart technologies combined with smart citizens that create smarter societies. And it's time to act. Besides industry for the DAO, uh, we need now finance for the DAO, uh, economy for the DAO, uh, governance for the DAO, uh, that means build a society for the DAO. Uh, we have now the science, we have the technology, we have 15 years to accomplish this task. So. It requires visionary people like you to create that framework. Thank you.